So it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here sharing this, uh, this event. I'm actually a trained economist, so uh, I've come to complexity not from physics, but as my colleagues here, but from economics. And so uh, being an economist, when the title was taking stock of complexity economics, I wonder if what the point was is we should buy stock in complexity economics, and I'm sure somebody will invent an index where you could trade on on this approach. So um, one issue is whether you know, we want to discuss methodology here. And uh, I'm reminded, if we're going to discuss uh, methodology, what Krugman said, that says, you know, those who can do, those who can't discuss methodology. So you might be impressed with the idea that maybe we're discussing methodology because we can't deliver the goods. But I'm, I want to tell you in my 15 minutes that we can deliver goods, OK? I'm also reminded what Lemer said, that methodology, like sex, is better demonstrated than discussed, though often better anticipated than experienced. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I also think this is important because uh, Thomas Huxley was very wrong when he said that science is organized common sense where many a beautiful theory has been killed by an ugly fact. Uh, economics is a scientific demonstration that you don't kill theories with facts because the theory is still alive and the facts have been disproven this theory forever, but you know, uncovered interest parity, this, that. There, we have a thousand, the law of one price, we have a thousand uh, violations of our assumptions, but if you don't give us an alternative theory, we'll keep on using the old theory because it's the only thing we have. So we need to deliver something alternative. And saying that things are complex or that you know, it's, uh, anything can happen is not terribly useful. Right? Uh, because uh, everybody will say, yeah, you know, everything can happen, but tell me, tell me something more, right? So um, uh, I'm, I'm going to finish this introduction by saying that uh, what we want is something where, uh, don't tell me just that the world is complex, tell me something insightful. And this was very well put by uh, Oliver Wellendale Holmes when he said, I would not give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. So you want to come out on the other side with some aha moment that, oh, gee, I didn't understand that before. So that's what I'm going to try to accomplish in my 15 minutes. So the fundamental questions in development economics are, why are some countries rich and other countries poor? Why some countries catch up? How did, why did this gap emerge? And why are some countries catching up and others are not? So that's a fundamental question about the world. Can we make sense of this uh, question in a different way by using some of these methods? And uh, ideally, so, so this is uh, you know, income per capita in the world, in, in the US over the last uh, 200 years or 500 years, it went up by a factor of 25 in the last 200 years. And we know that. And we also know that did this not this phenomenon did not happen everywhere in the world. It happened in Western Europe, it happened in Canada, it happened in Australia, it didn't happen in the rest of the world. So income gaps across the countries of the world ex have exploded in the last 200 years. And this here is how many times is the US richer than India, China, and Nigeria. And you see that until 1970, you have this explosion of the times in which the US was, so the factors by which the US was richer than India and China. And now we are seeing uh, this uh, collapse in some parts of the world, in India and China, and not in others. So what caused this great divergence of incomes, and what is causing this convergence of incomes? Can we make sense of that story? And so right now, apparently, we're starting to see the end of divergence, so the beginning of convergence. and. So the problem of the world, seen from this perspective, is the decline in global inequality. That's what's hurting us. Okay. So, <laughs> or, uh, anyway, so why are all these things happening? So <clears throat> to answer that, you have to have some characters. Okay? So uh, Aristotle said that the world was made out of earth, water, wind, and fire. Right? And those are the building blocks of, of the world. And physics evolved by saying, maybe this is not what the world is made out of. Maybe the world is made out of atoms. We don't know how many atoms, and we don't know what these things are. We don't know what their structure is. We don't know what they're made of. But suppose that there were atoms. Then you might ask yourself, you know, how many of them there are? How do they combine? Do they follow any rules when they combine? And lo and behold, they came up, and Mendeleev came up with a periodic table when nobody knew that whether atoms existed or not, 
uh, whether it were protons, neutrons, none of, all of those things were discovered in the subsequent 70 years. But a lot could be done by just looking at the world and a asking the world what you are made out of on some basic assumption. Maybe you're made of some stuff. So atoms do combine, and they do combine in these kinds of molecules, and then they form these other kinds of molecules, and then they form these complicated molecules like DNA. They end up forming more complicated things like cells, and then they end up making things like this, okay? So the idea that you're going to do all agents making decisions one way or another, and you're going to try to explain some macro phenomena. You don't really know what are the intermediate structures that are between one and the other. There are organizations, there are different kinds of specialties, there are different kinds of agents. We don't really know what is uh, all the kinds of relevant uh, uh, levels of aggregation that go be between the individual agent and the aggregate behavior. So economists have followed Aristotle in believing that the world is made out of uh, earth, water, wind, and fire, uh, but we call it by different names, okay? So land is all land. Capital, it doesn't matter if it's a building, it's a machine, it's labor, human capital, you know, years of schooling, maybe corrected by you know, some stuff. That's the thing the world is made out of, okay? So I'm going to say, let's, let's hold that assumption Let's just think that the world is made out of atoms, okay? So by the way, so, so I mean, the, the, the standard way is thinking that there's like these two basic putties, capital and labor, and, and you know, the, economic, the economy is a machine that does this. It mixes capital and labor to do anything, okay? So what I'm going to propose as an alternative view of the world is what I'm going to call the Scrabble theory of production, okay? That words, products are like words. They are made by letters. And I don't know what the letters are, okay? And think of them as productive capabilities of one, one sort or another, but I don't, I don't need to say more because, you know, Mendeleev didn't know what an atom was. Men, Mendel didn't know what a gene was. So let's say it's made by stuff, okay? So letters, okay? And not all combinations of letters are meaningful. You know? So, you know, the word music is meaningful. The word musib is not meaningful. The word usic is not meaningful, right? So this captures the idea of a rugged landscape that was referred to before. Now countries are going to have subsets of the alphabet, okay? Because they have subsets of the alphabet, they are going to be uh, able to write subsets of the dictionary, okay? Subsets of the universe of words, okay? So, in, in this view, you would say, well, maybe richer countries are countries that have more of the alphabet and consequently can write more of the dictionary. They can write more words or maybe longer words, more complicated words, okay? So suppose I just start with this assumption about the world. Can I make sense of some facts of the world? So let me see some intuition here. Countries that have more letters will be able to write more words. So they'll be more diversified. Hypothesis one. Products that require more letters will be harder to make, so fewer countries will have what it takes to make them. So those products will be made by fewer countries. We call that the number of countries that are able to make a product, the ubiquity of the product. Countries that have more letters will be able to make products that require more letters. They'll be able to make longer words, and consequently, they'll be able to make words that few other countries can make, okay? So uh, we conclude that the diversity of a country, which is an expression of how many letters it has, should be inversely related to how many other countries can make the things that that country makes, okay? So that's just by looking at that assumption of the world. So you would say, well, let's look at whether the world is like that. And, and to look at the world, you need a picture of the world, and that's a picture of the world at night, but that's not very informative. So I'm going to use this picture of the world, which I find terribly informative. Okay, this is a picture of the world where every row is a column and every, every, every row <laughs> is a country and every column is a product. And every pixel is how much of each product each country made. Now that is not terribly informative this way because things are ordered alphabetically and by code and so on. But if you allow me to reorder this matrix, it looks like this. And it says that some countries make few things, 
And other countries make many things. But what gives it the triangular structure is that the countries that make few things make things that everybody makes. And the countries that make, com, uh, the, uh, countries that make many things make those things too. Countries that make many things make these things too, but things that few other countries make. So these guys make things everybody makes. These guys make those things too, but a bunch of other things. So and this is using trade data for the world. We don't have production data for the world. We don't have services export data for the world, but I can look within countries. So thanks to my friend here, Andres Velasco, who, when he was finance minister, I got this data from from Chile, which says that you have 347 municipalities, 700 industries, and this says in which municipalities do you have which industries? And you get exactly the same triangular shape. And so this is for the world. This is how diversified you are, how many other countries make the things that you make. You ha have the same pattern. This is for the world. The US and Germany are here, and all the poor countries are up there. And this is for Chile. This is for Turkey. Within Turkey, the 86 cities, and this is for the US. We'll add them. So this is a pattern of the world. So the world is sort of like showing us that it's made by atoms. Okay? So let's do a little bit more with this. What I'm showing you is, is, that, is a network of countries and the products that they make. And what I'm going to posit, or what I'm positing with the Scrabble theory of production, is that countries have some components. And products require some components. And then in, in, what we see is the interaction of these things. Okay? And the question is, what is, what is the structure of this intermediate thing that is explaining um, the world? I like this thing that Mauro was saying, that I don't want to start axiomatically by knowing what these things are. I just want the data to tell me a little bit more. So in this model, we can derive one implication which is that uh, if you ask yourself how many, this is what fraction of the alphabet you have and what fraction of the dictionary you, you can write. Okay? And this says that in a world of longer words or a longer alphabet, if you say products are becoming more complex or technologies are becoming more varied, okay, that the, the proportion of the alphabet you need to have in order to write any words becomes much more convex. That is, unless you have many, many letters, you don't do anything. Okay? The more complicated the world, unless you have many, many letters, unless you have 60% of the letters, you don't do the first product. Unless you have 80% of the letters, you don't do very few. So the incentive to accumulate letters depends on how many letters you have. And this, to us, is a potential explanation for the great divergence that only the people who had many letters had an incentive to accumulate more letters because uh, uh, you know, productive capabilities are useless unless they're combined with other things. And this is uh, when, we, when we calibrate it to the world trade data in different classifications, that's what we get. So the world we live in has this quiescence trap that if you start with few letters, you don't want to move. Um, and, and so that's our interpretation of, of that. Um, I'm, uh, we developed a technique to measure how many letters a country has. And it uses simply, uh, if you have many letters, it means you make many products. So I can measure your diversification. But then I can ask, okay, but are, your, are your, the words you are making long words or short words? How do I know that? Well, how many other countries can make that? But maybe few countries can make it because it's a word like, say, diamonds, and not everybody has diamond mines. So how do I know that the diamond mines is not a long word? Because the countries that make diamonds don't make many other things. But if a diamond was a long word, those countries would have many letters. So essentially, we can derive a metric for how many letters you have, which is a, essentially a page rank, using the page rank algorithm on the data I just showed you. And, and, and what we have is this relationship between the number of letters you have and uh, the, how rich you are. By just looking at how, what you make and how many other people make what you make, you get this relationship, which has an R square of 0.73, between how rich you are and how many letters you have. Now, you might say 0.73 is not perfect, because not everybody's on the regression line. But here you have India. We say India is a country that is too poor for all the letters that it has. 
Maybe it shouldn't be that poor. Maybe India should grow. So maybe these errors are not pure errors. They are informative of the productive capacity of the country and where it's going. Well, at the other end, you have Greece. This model will say, why the hell is Greece so rich if they don't know how to do anything, right? So uh, the question is, uh, uh, does, this, uh, does this have, the, are these errors errors or are they informative? And what I have here is, what was this error in 1998 and how fast did countries grow over the subsequent 10 periods? So there's information content and in what you know how to make that determines where you're going. You're going to a level of income that can be supported by the letters you have. Then we developed another technique, which is to calculate how easy it is for you to accumulate letters. The problem with accumulating letters is that you don't want letters that are used by industries that don't exist, but industries cannot exist unless you have the letters. So this chicken and egg problem tends to be addressed by moving from the products you have to products that are not too far away in terms of letters. And we can calculate the distance between products in terms of letters, if you want. How, how, how close is one product to another product? So, and, and let me just, I'm, uh, and we have this relationship here. I'm going to take one and a half minutes. This relationship here between how many letters you have and how easy it is for you to accumulate more letters. And this was the relationship in 1978. Only the rich countries had a great incentive in accumulating more letters. We put this in a growth model and we explain growth better than anybody else. Okay, so this is a growth equation. If you're an economist, you know what it means. Uh, we're projecting growth over 10 year periods for 30, year, 30 years for which we have data. Our two variables, the economic complexity index, how many letters you have, and the opportunity value, how easy it is for you to accumulate more letters, explains everything that can be explained, or you know, R square is 0.43. Uh, it beats the hell out of education, finance, institutions, all those things don't explain much or don't add much once you've calculated the letters and how easy it is for you to accumulate more letters. So how do we explain the great divergence? Very simply, if you do these calculations for 1978, this is what you get. 1988, 1998, and 2008. The shape of the world changed. The distance between products in terms of the letters that they share or don't share, or the complexity of those letters changed. We can do further, we can ask ourselves, what would have been that relationship if technology hadn't changed, if we had remained at 1978 technology? What this says, that's the green line. If we had remained at 1978 technology, the world would not have converged. Something happened in the world that is facilitating this convergence. And my hypothesis is, that the world has become, a, 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 the, the world has become, a, 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 has split up the value chain. So countries used to have, used to need to have all the letters to make a word. Now they only need to make a syllable. And because they now need only to make a syllable, they can get into production while having fewer words and then add words more gradually. And it's the globalization of the value chain that is facilitating convergence. And this is a way of that to happen. But you see, I have not talked about agents. I have not talked about optimization. We are trying to describe reality that is way very aggregate. And we don't need to assume too much about the structures that are below it at this level of ignorance in which we find ourselves. Thank you.